One comment I get again and again is the claim that traditional Chinese martial arts have been wiped out in China by the communist government. According to this line of thought, the CCP has waged a campaign to systematically wipe out traditional culture from the country, and it's only surviving in places like Taiwan, Hong Kong, and among the Chinese diaspora of Southeast Asia and the West. So, is this true? I try to remain as objective and apolitical as I can with this channel. And so while this is a topic that I've been hesitant to talk about, it's also something that's plagued with misinformation on both sides. And like all things, the truth is never so black and white. So let's unpack this and start by looking at some modern history. So before we get into today's video, I'd like to thank you so much for your support running this channel. I've just hit 37,000 subscribers. So thank you so much for that. That's absolutely fantastic. Now, I'm wondering if we can get that number even higher and we can aim 50,000 subscribers. So if you like these videos, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. I really, really appreciate that. And at the same time, I'd also like to point out that the main purpose of this channel is to bring objective, unbiased and agenda-free information on traditional Chinese martial arts to document the various styles across China as well as the Chinese diaspora throughout Asia. And so in order to do that, um, I do need your help. And so if you enjoy what I do and you find value in it, then I'd appreciate it if you could head to my online store, monkeyofficepeach.com, where you can get a range of traditional Kung Fu clothing, um, channel merchandise such as a t-shirt I'm wearing and hoodies and things like that. You can also get um, a range of traditional Chinese tea wear like what I've got in front of me, as well as Chinese teas like the one that I'm drinking today, which is a Dao Hong Pao, or big red robe, a Wulong tea from Fujian province. So yeah, head on over to monkeyofficepeach.com. You can get 10% off your first order. Um, also, I have a Patreon, so if you'd like to support that way, you can go to patreon.com slash monkeystealspeach, where you can get access to lots of behind the scenes footage, extra content from my travels, as well as some of my own ideas and practices in Chinese martial arts. Again, thank you so much, and back to the video. To start at the beginning, in 1899, the Boxer Rebellion broke out in Northern China. Large groups of rural peasants banded together in an uprising aimed at ridding China of foreign influence. The group called themselves the Yihe Quan, or the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists. They unleashed two years of terror on the country before being defeated by the Eight Nation Alliance, a group of mostly Western powers. As many of the boxers practice some kind of martial arts, along with magical and pseudo-religious practices, such as spirit possession and incantations, the fallout from the rebellion led many in China to view martial arts with disdain. When the Republic was founded in 1911, there was much discussion about what the future of the nation should be. Traditional culture and its place in society was a big part of that conversation. There were those that called for the total abolishment of traditional practices and the adoption of Western values and customs. Others felt that traditional culture should be reframed in a more modern light, in a similar way to what had happened in Japan. In the end, the nationalist government, or Kuomintang, agreed to this latter idea and introduced a policy called the New Life Movement. Part of this was reframing martial arts as a form of physical and spiritual cultivation for the Chinese people, a practice which could help instill the values of being a good citizen in this changing society. The Jingwu Athletic Association had already been promoting this idea for some time, and the government then set up their own institute called the National Martial Arts Institute, or Zhongyang Guo Shuguan, to promote their own standardized martial art practice across the country. However, in 1949, after a fierce civil war, the Kuomintang were defeated by the communists of Mao Zedong and retreated to Taiwan. The Reds have changed the face of China and brought the world's largest country within the communist empire. Mao had his own ideas for the future of China, which was much more radical. He saw much of the traditional culture as backwards and felt it had no place in the modern world. After a power struggle within the Communist Party between the hardliners and the more reform-minded, in an attempt to regain full power, in 1966, Mao instigated what he called the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. 
in which he delegated authority to groups of radical students to purge society of what he termed the four olds, old culture, old customs, old thought and old habits. The great proletarian cultural revolution, initiated and led personally by Chairman Mao, is aimed at eradicating bourgeois ideology, establishing proletarian ideology, remolding people's souls, revolutionizing their thinking, uprooting revisionism, and consolidating and developing the socialist system. During this time, up to two million people are believed to have been killed. As these radical students, known as the Red Guards, set about dismantling the social fabric of the country. Anyone with any connection to the old society was persecuted, including, of course, martial artists. The Cultural Revolution ended with Mao's death ten years later, and from the 1980s, the new leader, Deng Xiaoping, set about undoing the damage of this period and reforming China. This was also the period when the CCP began developing its modern performance-based wushu, rebranding and standardizing martial arts based on aesthetic value. Masters of traditional arts were hired and tasked with creating new routines, most of which were based on long fist styles, but with a strong influence from acrobatics and even Soviet-style ballet. Modern wushu was adopted by the sports departments of major universities across the country, and in more recent times has been fervently promoted overseas, as well as a bid to get it into the Olympics. However, it never really took off among the general population, as the amount of dedication required to perform these difficult movements is beyond the scope of the average person. And this is an especially important point, given that during this period of turmoil in China, most of the population was living in severe poverty and would not have been able to devote time to such an endeavour. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Taiwan Strait, the Kuomintang government was still internationally recognised as the legitimate government of China. Chiang Kai-shek ruled the island with an iron fist, but he did encourage traditional culture to flourish there, albeit at the expense of local Taiwanese culture, customs and dialect. With China and Taiwan being on opposite sides of the Cold War, they set about their own soft power campaigns to discredit each other. Taiwan latched onto the horrors of the Cultural Revolution and framed itself as the guardian of traditional Chinese culture. Against all prophecies, Formosa still keeps the anti-communist flag flying, only a hundred miles or so off the mainland of China. It's a prosperous island where the new generations grow up in freedom, a complete contrast to conditions under the rule of Mao Zedong. China claimed that Taiwan was a puppet of the West, and still to this day puts out the notion that democracy and other Western values are contradictory to traditional Chinese thought. With nobody knowing exactly what was going on behind the bamboo curtain, it was safe to assume that most traditional culture probably was destroyed inside China. However, once China opened its doors to the world in the 1980s, a more nuanced picture emerged. In fact, many martial artists had survived and gradually began openly teaching again. It turned out that far from being a coordinated attack on Chinese culture, the Cultural Revolution was more of a mess. With rampant infighting between factions of Red Guards, many of them using their position to further their own interests. This included martial artists as well, some of whom became Red Guards and used their position to get to practice their martial arts on other people. Some also used their position to protect the teachers, keeping rival groups from going near them. Other martial artists simply retreated to the remote countryside, where infrastructure was still poor, far away from the big cities where the class struggle was most prominent. From my own experience, living in China for over 13 years, and speaking to countless people who've lived through that period, I can say that the biggest damage the Cultural Revolution caused to Chinese martial arts was the personal trauma of those who lived through it. Many masters' physical and emotional health suffered greatly during that period. Many of their treasured heirlooms, such as antique weapons and old manuscripts, had been destroyed, confiscated. Many had been persecuted by the Red Guards, betrayed by their own students. Some of them had become Red Guards themselves and done things that they later regret while being swept up in the fervour. However, for the most part, their martial arts still survived reasonably intact. As China moved into the position of being a world power, classical Marxist-Leninist rhetoric has been lessened and the party has sought to use Chinese culture and thought to legitimise itself. This rhetoric has become especially prominent since Taiwan has moved away from branding itself as the real China. 
and more as a progressive and liberal East Asian democracy. Examples of the Chinese Communist Party using traditional culture as part of its soft power approach are the renovation of the Shaolin Temple and subsequent promotion of its rebranded version of Shaolin Kung Fu. The focus on using cinema to spread its message to the world. And of course, the 2008 Olympic Games. What I found when exploring the martial arts in places such as Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Southeast Asia is that while the overall practice is much the same, the main difference that I've found is that in these places there is a much greater emphasis on traditional social structures, a much more conservative attitude towards the arts overall. The reality is Chinese martial arts, as practiced today, are largely a legacy of modern history. The position Kung Fu holds in society, and how and why it's practiced, has changed vastly over the past several hundred years. It's been shaped by wars, famines, colonialism, and revolutions. Overall, I found that no matter where I visited, teachers grapple with the same challenges. The lack of interest among young people, the greater attraction of modern combat sports, and the pressures that modern living has on how much time people can devote to practice. And so, rather than being divided over who has the real thing, Chinese martial artists around the world should come together and be united in promoting the arts that we love. Rather than bickering and infighting, we should focus on how to overcome the challenges that we as Chinese martial artists all face.